Let us pray as Christ the Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. O God, who by the mystery of today's great feast, sanctify your whole church in every people and nation. Pour out, we pray, the gifts of the Holy Spirit across the face of the earth. And with the divine grace that was at work when the gospel was first proclaimed, fill now once more the hearts of believers. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. The Lord be with you. Blessed be the name of the Lord, now and forever. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us bless the Lord. This evening, we bring to conclusion this year's Lectio Divina. I think this is the 16th that I've done over the years uh, from the time I began in, uh, in Edmonton and now continue to here in Toronto. And so this year, the theme has been that of repentance, conversion, the call of the Lord by which he expresses to us his mercy but in which he invites us to turn away from the path of darkness into the path of light, keeping in mind that great line from the early Christian tradition, from the teaching of the 12 apostles, there are two ways, the way to life and the way to death, and there is a great difference between them. And so the readings during this year have stressed that point in different ways, the way we move from the way to death to the way to life in conversion keeping in mind the first words of the Lord, which are, repent, for the kingdom of God is near at hand. And the reading today is the last of the series. This is from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. And the letter to the Romans is very uh, difficult. Some passages are very complex. I think St. Paul had a very complex mind. And sometimes they deal with issues which do not seem to be pressing to us as they were to the early Christians. For example, the role of the Jewish and the Gentile Christians and how they relate to one another and things of that nature. But throughout the letter to the Romans, this greatest of all his letters, he calls us to trust in the Lord God, to give our lives, to be made pure and transformed, not by our own efforts, but by the grace of God, trusting in our Lord Jesus Christ. And in different ways, he, he speaks of that. And he speaks of what happens when we don't do that, and he speaks of what happens when we do. So that leads up, the first 11 chapters of the letter to the Romans are this difficult, complex struggle, trying to find out how we deal with our own human frailty, dealing with our struggles in this world, and how to trust in the provident hand of God and to give ourselves to the Lord. Throughout this letter to the Romans, there are some passages which are not simply difficult. Much of the letter to the Romans, I think, you have to have a good stiff cup of coffee with you and figuring it out and trying, what does he mean? 
And after we struggle with it, wrestle with it a bit, it's, it's worthwhile, but it's, it's tough going. But some parts are kind of transparent. They're not such heavy sledding. One of them is, and we all know chapter seven of Romans, I know what I should do, but I don't do what I know I should do, and I do what I know I shouldn't do. We've all been there day by day. It's our struggle. Oh, what am I going to do? And I suppose and I assume that St. Paul himself knew what that was like. And then he bursts into this glorious life in the Spirit in chapter 8. Something similar to that is found in the passage for this evening's portion for Lectio Divina. He's moved along in chapter 9, 10, and 11 to some difficult, complex issues of the relationship between the Jewish and the Gentile portions of the community. But it all ends off then with a statement of praise, thanksgiving to God for his mercy to everyone, Jew or Gentile, whoever, God's mercy to everyone. And that, of course, is a theme that our Holy Father, Pope Francis, stresses very, very much, as indeed Pope John Paul did very much in his great encyclical and rich in mercy. So that's what we come to just before the passage today. The last chapters of the letter to the Romans, like the last chapters of most of St. Paul's letters, go from, you might say, the theoretical and the theological, the foundations, the scheme at the beginning where we see the plan of God outlined for us, to the more nitty-gritty practical things. So chapters 12 and 13 speak to us of if we really recognize what God is doing in our life, then what is the effect, practically speaking? If he does have such mercy for us, how should it show day by day? And chapter 12 and 13 especially give us an overview of that. And then the other chapters he goes, gives through some particular points they're dealing with in the community in Rome. Uh, they always say, you know, I think all politics is retail, not wholesale, it's all retail, it's all fixing potholes. And I think that's true with our life in Christ too. All Christianity is retail. It's dealing with the nitty gritty of our life, but within the context of our vision in faith of the great mercy and providence of God. So that's what we have in these chapters. So this evening, I will meditate upon, and we'll be reflecting upon all of chapter 12, which is a lot, 21 verses. So I will use the system they use in Hebrew. I'll leave out the vowels and speed things up. There we are. And also, I'd love to do chapter 13 too, but I mean, there's only a limit to what you can do. So I can't resist, however, the last verses 11 to 14 of chapter 13 of the letter to the Romans. So I'll skip over from 12 to that. And that passage is one of the most significant in all of history because young Augustine had begun to experience the grace of God in his heart and he was troubled by the empty life he was leading which he speaks of in his confessions, you know, when he speaks of how long he struggled to get away from his arrogance and his pride and pretty well all the deadly sins he was, he was guilty of. You know, late have I loved you, O beauty ever ancient, ever new. Late have I loved you, and behold, you are within, and I was outside, and outside I sought you, and deformed ran after those forms of beauty that you had made. You were with me, and I was not with you. Those things held me back from you things whose only being was to be in you. You flashed, you shone, you broke through my blindness. You called, you cried, you broke through my deafness. You touched me and I longed for your embrace. But what led him to that was when he was in a garden in Milan with some of his friends. And he heard a little child in the next garden, probably the next backyard we would say, saying, take and read, take and read, take and read. So he had a New Testament in front of him. He picked up this passage. And that is how we'll end this year. It is the night is far gone, the day is at hand. Let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us conduct ourselves becomingly as in the day, not in reveling in drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Then 
the light went on. And from that moment on, Augustine became Saint Augustine. He then turned his life from the way that leads to death to the way that leads to life. May each one of us in these verses, these sacred, powerful, potent verses of the letter to the Romans, may that happen in our hearts as well. And so that's how we'll end off this year's uh, Lecture Divina. I don't know about next year's. I'm thinking, I've got to think of 10, nine or 10, usually 10, but I sometimes have to miss a, a month for, you know, uh, reasons. But nine or 10 passages of sacred scripture, about 10 to 20 verses each, on some kind of a theme. So if you have any suggestions, just let me know. Send me some suggestions of, I've done 10 parables, 10 psalms. We've done, I've done the, Sermon on the Mount, we've broken it up into 10 pieces, um, 10 different things, we've done all kinds of different things. We've gone through the whole of the letter of James in five pieces, it's that short. For three years, we went through the letter, the, the Gospel of Mark, broken into 20 verse sections. I'm thinking maybe wisdom literature, uh, you know, the Proverbs, Ecclesiasticus, maybe stuff like that. Maybe the Song of Songs, maybe Job. Job might be appropriate these days, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, we can't do the whole of Job, but maybe, or maybe the Proverbs. So may, that's what I'm thinking of right now, but I'll let you know over the summer. And uh, now, however, Romans chapter 12 and a little glorious bit of chapter 13. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle on us the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and we shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us let go all those things that clutter up our lives, our worries, our cares. Just let them go. Let's ask God's forgiveness for the sins that are rocks and boulders on the pathway into our heart. Let they be taken away, let them be removed, so the Lord may have a path into our hearts. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I bid every one among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith which God has assigned to him. For as in one body we have many members, and all the members do not have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them, if prophecy, in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, he who teaches in his teaching, he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who contributes in liberality, he who gives aid with zeal, he who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Never flag in zeal. Be aglow with the Spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in your hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless, do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly and never be conceited. Repay no one evil for evil. 
but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends upon you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Besides this, you know what hour it is, how it is full time now for you to wake from your sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. Let us then cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us conduct ourselves becomingly as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. I appeal to you, therefore, therefore, because all of the letters led up to this point and ends with a great song to the mercy of God. Therefore, if God is so merciful, what do we do? What happens then? How does it affect us? What are the implications? I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. In the old system of worship, we would offer up the animals and things like that as a form of symbolic sacrifice to God. That's sort of what we do when we incense. Incense is our prayers rising to God, and it's also a kind of sacrificial offering. We'd have that in the old temple of the Old Testament as a kind of symbol of our prayers, ourselves rising up, burnt up before the Lord. Symbolic, second level. But he says, I appeal to you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, since God is so merciful to you, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. I mean, give your whole self as a living sacrifice, not an animal or incense or something, Give your whole self, you, give your whole self, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Here I am, Lord, I come to do your will. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it done unto me according to thy word. This is why it's good to pray the Angelus regularly throughout the day as a sign of our sacrificial worship, saying, here I am, Lord, I come to do your will. Not symbolically, like putting incense and stuff like that, but our very selves. This is where we exercise our Christian priesthood through baptism, by offering ourselves, our whole self, to the Lord. In humble service, loving God, serving neighbor, sacrificially giving of self, not clinging, me, 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 but giving of self. That's the sacrifice which the Lord showed us in Calvary. And we see a bit more about that later on when we talk about, he speaks of giving back good for bad. That's the kind of sacrificial love, a spiritual worship. That's what we need to be. We should stand out from this world in which we live. So let's think about that. Is that how I'm living my life? Each one of us, let's think about that. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Lord, help me to be that way, day by day. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed 
by the renewal of your mind, that you may prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Do not be conformed to this world. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. But this world also means in scripture what we experience. In this world, which, as in the book of Revelation we hear, it's Babylon the Great, and we are colonized by it. We set out to evangelize the world, and we can end up being de-evangelized by the world. It's a powerful force. The world, the flesh, the devil. All three of them are at work. Sometimes people don't believe in the third of those, but that just means they don't, they're just out of touch with where are they, what planet do they live on. The world, the flesh, and the devil, all of them are real, potent, none of them omnipotent by any means, only God is that. But they are the sea in which we swim, they affect that, they're the air through which we fly, they're the environment we breathe, and we can be conformed to this world. Just as we can gratify the desires of the flesh, at the end he speaks of that, that isn't just lust, that's pride, anger, envy, greed, laziness, lust, gluttony, all of them are the flesh, the earthly soul that is disconnected from the Lord. So do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. It's our whole body we offer, and our mind is renewed. That's the whole of us. We're not like spirits floating around and bodies over here that are kind of like a shell. Our whole self is transformed. And our mind, the gift God gave us, needs to be renewed. That you may prove what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. That's what we're called to. We're called to be saints. And it's not some extraordinary thing. A few, the elite, maybe they can do that. But not the rest of us, not ordinary sort of ordinary Christians. No, not on at all. We are all called to holiness. And the kind of elitist idea that only a few people can live the demands of the Christian faith, and for the common folk it's just sort of second rate, that is elitist and very often kind of clerical, but sometimes said by kind of clerical types. No, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that you may prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. I wish I had with me a little piece of paper I, I have back in my room, and I wish I had memorized it, but it's, it's, from, it's from Cardinal Newman. But what it is to be perfect. It doesn't mean lifting off and levitation, all that kind of stuff. He, he analyzes in about two or three paragraphs, so it's something he gave to the people in the oratory in Birmingham, what it is to be perfect. It means to do not lie abed beyond the due time of rising, say your prayers, eat and drink to the glory of God, make an examination of conscience, do your duty, what is good, acceptable, and perfect, day by day, nothing extraordinary, but just the ordinary round of things, he says. And then you are perfect. You are what God wants you to be where you are. God does not expect extraordinary people, for there are none of them, but God takes ordinary people, all of us, and gives us by his grace extraordinary gifts of holiness. So, don't be conformed, be transformed. Let's reflect upon this now and say, what does it say to my head, my heart, my hands? We should do that for all of scripture. What does it reveal to me about God's will? How does it draw me closer in love for the Lord? And tomorrow, specifically, or maybe for the rest of the day, what am I actually gonna do about it? Words, words, words. What am I gonna do about it in my life? Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may prove what is the will of God, what is good acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I bid everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, 
but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith which God has assigned to him. For by the grace given to me, I bid everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. We should think of the hymn in Philippians where St. Paul quotes probably a hymn that he would sing at the Eucharist or something like that, but make yourself like the Lord Jesus who did not cling to his equality with God, but emptied himself, taking this life, even to death, death on the cross. That is that emptying of self, that humility. Don't think too highly of yourselves. Oh, that, what, a, what a struggle we have so much in our relationships, relationships individually with other people, families, parishes, the whole church, the world. We're all kinds of ego-driven people. We're all that way. The smallest letter and the most deadly in the alphabet is I. Ego, thinking highly of myself where I am thinking I'm absorbed into my own agenda. And everyone else, I don't listen to them and I don't pay attention to them. I just am moving forward. And that's the way, boom, we start crashing into one another, scheming and breaking down. And community cannot live that way either. In a community where a bunch of narcissists are bumping into one another, it's not, it's like, it's not like those things you see those cars you know, in those games, those parks where they boing, boing, but they have big bumpers, boom, boom, boom. It's kind of fun, I think. I've never done it, but it looks like it's fun. But in real life, there are no bumpers. We just bang into one another. And no, by the grace given to me, I bid everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't think of ourselves. Love your neighbor as yourself. We should love ourselves. We should thank God every day for the gifts he has given to us. Humility, I remember I read just, well, I, no, I heard it from a retreat just recently for the priest. Humility doesn't mean thinking less of yourself. It means thinking of yourself less. That's a good line, I remember thinking. Humility doesn't mean thinking less of yourself. I'm horrible, I'm trash, I'm terrible. No, no, that's not humility because God made me and I'm not trash. We always got to remember that. We're gifts of God. So humility doesn't mean thinking less of yourself. It means thinking of yourself less. Move out and help other people. Be forgetful of self. In other words, don't think of yourself more highly than he ought to think. But be think with sober judgment. Think of the good gifts I've got. How can I serve? And he's about to talk about that. My weaknesses? Forgive me, Lord and look at, fight, uh, like the fight, instead of fighting other people, let's strive to honor other people. He'll talk about that in a moment. So let's think of that now in our lives. When we get into our own little ego cage, let's listen to Paul and just puncture that ego. And what a better world it would be if we thank God for all he's given us that's humility. I'm very good at this. Thank you, Lord. I'm very good at that. Thank you, Lord. That's humility, but not to be thinking wrongly about myself so that I'm ignoring other people or trying to dominate other people. For by the grace given to me, I bid every one among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith which God has assigned to him in proper order. Let's ask the Lord to help us to do that. For as in one body, we have many members and all the members do not have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. There's a beautiful hymn, we are one body one body in Christ. That's very true. We are one body, one body in Christ. And we have many different functions and God gives each one of us graces. And we are to work together. He uses this image also 
in other places in his writings. For as in one body we have many members, and all the members do not have the same function, some are to do this, some are to do that, and he'll talk about that in a moment. Each person is called to fulfill the mission given to him or her within the body of Christ. And let's not say it's all mine. No, each has a mission. Let us thank the Lord God for it, use our gifts abundantly in it, and then praise the Lord God and serve our neighbor. For as in one body we have many members and all the members do not have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. We are one body in Christ linked together. Brothers and sisters in Christ joined together. Why then such controversies, such ferociousness within the body of Christ. We have to find a way of disagreeing, which we're always gonna do if we feel passionately about our faith. We're always gonna disagree, but to do so in a way that is charitable. Clear, clarity and charity. You gotta have the clarity and the charity together. So may we have that. We're all one with one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. There's a book, I forget who wrote it, a book called Gifts Differing. And it has to do with, it's about, the, I think it's about the Myers-Briggs test where uh, they try to figure out different strengths people have, different ways they approach problems and issues. And we all have different ways, like our own fingerprint, we have different ways of approaching things. But they're all part of the gift of God. And so we just need to use them in different ways. That's one of the great foundations of a tremendous movement in the church, which I really think is fruitful. It's called the stewardship movement. Now, unfortunately, as soon as you use the word stewardship, you think of fundraising. And that's, that's not, I don't know, I wish that hadn't hijacked the word, because it kind of robs us of a profound thought. But this is that each one of us has differing gifts. God gave us some to do this, some to do that. And so we are stewards of the gifts of God. A steward is entrusted with something and must hand it back to the master, as in the parable of the talents. The steward is given, the servant is given, it doesn't own it, but is given the gifts in order to make use of them fruitfully, contribute to them to the common good, and let them be developed to the glory of God and the service of our neighbor. We have gifts differing. And that's why in the stewardship movement, and uh, there's a wonderful thing by the American bishops called stewardship, a disciple's response, which speaks of the attitude of gratitude for, for God's gifts to us, and how in every parish, if we all look at what are the gifts that I can contribute, then the whole goal and point of it is we are one body, one body in Christ. Some of us can do something, and all of us can do everything if each of us does what we are gifted to do. And so we just need to kind of work it out that way in our parishes, our diocese, and the universal church. I really think that's a fruitful thought and a fruitful way of approaching. It isn't like a new movement. It isn't really a new system. It's simply the way we should approach the gifts of God. So let's think of that. As in one body, we have many members and all the members do not have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, he who teaches in his teaching, he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who contributes in liberality, he who gives aid with zeal, he who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let's not help people saying, here, I'll give you some help, ha ha, you know. Don't put people down, we, that's with cheerfulness. That's part of our life. And all these different people with different gifts build up the body of Christ. And if we can only work it out that way, not in competition, but in that cooperative spirit of recognizing each of us has received the gifts, different gifts from the Lord, all to the glory of God and the service of our neighbor. Oh, how our church can be transformed 
And then in our parishes, we don't have some people burnt out and other people left out, or feeling they are. But everyone, it spreads the engagement, spreads it out, so that everyone is fruitfully engaged according to the gifts that God gives, and nobody gets sort of over-engaged or under-engaged. If we can do that when we are among the gathered, how we will reach out to the scattered who will see something beautiful there. I think that's what, it's a good vision, I think, for the way we should live together as the body of Christ in this world. This vision we get from St. Paul. In Rome and in Corinth, as in Toronto and everywhere, that's not the way it was working out. And none of us, we always are struggling in our own hearts. There were people, remember, in, uh, uh, we have in Corinth, I'm for Apollo, I'm for Cephas, you know, that, that kind of stuff. We get that in the whole church. But we've got to move towards this vision. And it's because we're frail. It takes a lifetime, but the Lord is with us to help us. Oh Lord, may we live this way, thanking you for the gifts you give us in all humility and thankfulness. May we offer the gifts you have given to each of us in a particular way. May we offer them to your glory and to the service of our neighbor. May we thank you, Lord, for the gifts other people have that we don't have, for they too give glory to God at our service to our neighbor. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. That's our competition. We're striving to show one another honor. What a way, that's beautiful. That's like, you know, the story you hear about heaven and hell, where in, they're both great banquets, but the forks and knives are supersized, and in hell, people there are, can't eat because they can't get the food up to their mouths with all the, with the size of the instruments, with the knives and forks. So they're frustrated and angry in this beautiful banquet, they can't eat it. But in heaven, it's the same banquet, the same fork, same knives, same spoons, but the members at the table are feeding one another and using the instruments to help others. That's a good model and image and parable for the way we should be. So let's outdo one another, not in knocking one another down or being envious about other people's success. Why does this person have such talents and I do not? Well, what? really, we don't have time for that. Let's just outdo one another in showing honor. Never flag in zeal, but be aglow with the Spirit. Serve the Lord. This isn't rocket science. This is, you know, be aglow with the Spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in your hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and practice hospitality. It's just simple as that. It's so nice. A thank you, a please, a thank you. Pope Francis is really often mentions that. He has a great section of his uh, letter, uh, Amoris Laetitiae, on, and also some of his little speeches and talks he gives about, I'm sorry, please, thank you. <laughs> These little things. Let's just say thank you to a lot of people. Just, you know, we don't say thank you to a machine when we put in the money in a, you know, some pop comes out. No, because it's a thing, not a person. And that's why it's a little odd. I remember I was at a place once where you put the stuff in the garbage and the, the garbage can said, thank you. Really? really that's, that gets it wrong. There's something creepy about that. <laughs> but, thank you. Thank you. You know, it's like a computer. <laughs> No, it's with people. We thank one another. We write little notes of thanks and stuff like that. Be hospitable. I mean, this is like, again, Christianity is retail, not wholesale. It's these little things which we so often forget. That's why mothers tell children to write thank you notes and things like that. It's so important. It's what helps us in our frailty to live together as the body of Christ in this very, very stressful world. Oh, that there would be more of this. I'm always very thankful. Some of us are kind of introverts, like I'm a very introverted kind of guy, um, although I have to speak in public a lot, but I've overcome that. 
But some people are always grateful in every presbyter, in every group of priests I've ever been part of, there always are a few priests who have this gift of hospitality. And they think of calling up people and saying, come on over, and you know, this, is, this is beautiful. And you, know, there, you might have a couple of people sitting there sort of too shy to phone. And it's great to have someone just come over here. And that kind of graciousness, courtesy, graciousness. These are noble, and they're part of the charisms of the grace of the body of Christ. So let's just think about that. Think of particular ways in our life that we can live this graciousness. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdoing one another in showing honor. Never flag in zeal, be aglow with the Spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in your hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. And practice hospitality. As the old Benedictine saying goes, receive each person as Christ. Bless those who persecute you. Bless, do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. We tend to strike back at people who offend us. That maybe is the most, a very painful thing. People can, who, when they have been truly offended or hurt, persecuted by someone, it's very easy to hold on to it, even after the persecutor's forgotten about it and goes scot-free, goes way off they go. But that pain can, res can just eat away at a person, even apart from the graciousness of God. It's just, it wastes our time. We don't have a lot of it in this world. So bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. We just don't have time to be cursing people because we just turn bitter and then that doesn't hurt the person we're cursing, it's hurting us, you know, apart from the fact it's not what we're supposed to do. That's where, you know, we have an extraordinary example in our brothers and sisters who are the Coptic Christians of Egypt. An extraordinary example. I go frequently, too frequently, I'm afraid, to their church in Mississauga for the various memorial services which they have. When those 22 young men were beheaded on the beach, now, people going to a, a monastery were shot in these buses. They were pulled out, told to deny Christ, and they never did. None of them do. They do not deny Christ. They were killed. And you would think that that would lead to cursing and rioting and things like that. Not at all. I just edified at the love and the true spirit of Christ our Lord, which is found among our Coptic brothers and sisters who are being persecuted mercilessly in an evil, so profound, so unknown, like all of the persecution of our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world, so hidden, and yet out of this, they come with love for the ones who do it. I mean, this is Christ on the cross. And we need to be that way. It's not easy for any of us. We all tend to lash out. You hit me, I hit you, you know. And there's just no future in that. But it's our instinctive reaction. <laughs> so we pray the Lord, each one of us, to be freed of that. And that's what he's talking about here. And it also affects our whole community. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Let's have a little compassion, suffer with the people, be, be with them. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be conceited. Repay no one evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If possible, as far as it depends upon you, live peaceably with all. He has noticed it's hard, if possible, and so far as it depends upon you. Sometimes we do get into conflict. We do need to rebuke. We do need to challenge. But I remember Don Bosco, the great saint, 
he said whenever he was going to have to rebuke a child, one of his students, he always spent about a week in prayer so that it wouldn't be his ego that would be taking out, but it would be for actually for the good of the other person. We should be very careful. That's why people, you know, let's, you know, yelling and all that, that's just not the future. That's just, it's so unchristian. We have to go beyond it. And as I say, we can look to our heroic Coptic brothers and sisters and many, many others around the world, many, many others who are facing far more than we'll ever face. They show us Christ and we need to learn. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So leave it to the Lord. I mean, it's in the hands of God. We're not God. We simply think, why did the person do this? I don't know. But if I spend my whole life stewing over it, I'm just going to have a miserable life and I'm not going to help the person or me. And anyway, what can I do? So it's in your hands, O oh Lord. And if God punishes the person, if we hope and pray everyone will repent. You know, we wish that Judas had repented, but I don't know, maybe you never know. There's the old saying, twixt the stirrup and the ground, salvation may be found. We never know. But it's none of our business, really. Let's just, let's just let it go. Let it go, let it go, let it go. We just can't get into that. He'll eat us up. And then he even has this thing, no, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him to drink. Now, this is a great line. I think, I don't know what, nobody knows you know what this means. It's almost kind of funny. This is partly because we should feed and give to drink to our enemy. That's the good thing. But it's going to drive him crazy. <laughs> no, he'll put burn coals of fire in his head. This, this is a little bit unworthy, but kind of funny. And I suspect maybe St. Paul every once in a while puts a little sly dig in there. And so for by sowing to doing, you will heap burning coals upon his head. You know, <laughs> you don't play his game. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. It's, that's the bottom line. Don't be colonized by this world. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And then he speaks about dealing with the public authorities. That's the first part of chapter 13, loving one another. And then this astonishing, world-changing passage, which took a very proud, egotistical Augustine and was the entryway by which the grace of God transformed him. And he came to holiness, and may we as well. Besides this, you know what hour it is, how it is full time for you to wake from your sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. This may be why the great St. John Fisher kept a skull on his desk. Tick, 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 time's up. The day is at hand. And I always think, I mean, I mentioned this before, but I'm always astonished by the last hours of the great St. John Fisher, the Bishop of Rochester, when literally the day was at hand and he was gonna be beheaded by the evil King Henry VIII. And so at about, four or five in the morning, the jailer shook him awake and said, Bishop Fisher, you will be executed today. You'll be beheaded today by order of the king. And he said, what time is it? Five o'clock. When's the execution? Nine o'clock. Well, wake me up about eight. And he rolled over and went back to sleep. <laughs> oh my. But, you know, Sam Johnson, the great English writer, said, the prospect of being executed in a couple of weeks concentrates the mind wonderfully. And so we need to think about this. Think, really? You know, day by day, each day. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. Let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us conduct ourselves becomingly as in the day, 
not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Away with all that. The day is coming. The night is gone. Let's not do these things that hide in darkness. The place, you know, let's not flip over the rocks and see what's crawling underneath. Away with it all. Let the sun shine. For the Lord is coming. And we don't know when. Two seconds, 50 years, three days. We don't know when. So every day, be ready to meet the Lord. Not in a grim sort of sense of fear, but in a serene sense of, here I am, Lord. I come to do your will. But let's not waste our time in all these things that belong, that are hidden in darkness. We can tell if something is wrong if we're afraid to let the light shine on it. That's a simple test. So I remember another retreat director said to the priests, a priest should always have a private life, but never a secret life. And I think that's true for us as Christians, all of us really. A Christian should have a private life. There are a lot of things we do privately. We do not, you know, we have privacy, but not a secret life which is a private life we'd be ashamed to have anyone see. That's a secret life. And that we, is the deeds of darkness. No time for that. That's just no. And those words, they clicked in the heart of Augustine. So put on the Lord Jesus Christ, make no provision for the flesh to gratify his desires. And it's not just lust there. It's the whole, above all, the ego and pride of the flesh. The world, the flesh, the devil, who tempts us into all this. We don't have time for that. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I bid every one among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith which God has assigned to him. For as in one body we have many members, and all the members do not have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, he who teaches in his teaching, he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who contributes in liberality, he who gives aid with zeal, he who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness, let love be genuine. Hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Never flag in zeal. Be aglow with the Spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in your hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be conceited. Repay no one evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends upon you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink, for by doing so, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Besides this, you know what hour it is, how it is full time now for you to wake from your sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. 
the day is at hand. Let us then cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us conduct ourselves becomingly as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. 